This week, we welcome Omkar Arasaratnam, General Manager at OpenSSF, and we're going to discuss memory safety or not so safety, rewriting software or not rewriting software, and open source security supply chains. In the security news, end of life routers and exploits, SCCM misconfigurations lead to compromise. Apparently, you can hack anything with a flipper zero. That's what I heard. Do source code leaks matter? Visibility is important. Printer vulnerabilities that no one cares about. Friendship gets you firmware. Lock hacking continues. VM escapes and risk. And multiple really cool Bluetooth hacking stories. All that and more on this episode of Paul's Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production. For security professionals, by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. It's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. In the ever-present threat of cyber attacks, even a simple wrong click can spell disaster. ThreatLocker built endpoint protection so you can operate a zero-trust security posture built on a default deny. ThreatLocker allows you to control what runs and what those applications can do, access, and how they interact. Don't let your trusted applications be used against you. For comprehensive protection against evolving threats, turn to ThreatLocker Cyber Heroes at securityweekly.com forward slash ThreatLocker. Identity is at the core of every great digital experience. Ping Identity solutions support the scale, flexibility, and resiliency required by enterprise-level IT teams for lasting digital transformation. With 99.99% uptime and over 3 billion identities under management, they're the only identity vendor that's proven to champion the scale, performance, and security of large enterprises. That's why Ping Identity champions your unique identity needs. They give you the tools to offer your users the right access at the right times, no matter how they connect with you. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash ping identity to learn more. And welcome to the show. But first, let me introduce you to this guy somewhere over here that does a thing with some stuff that you probably don't want to know about. Mr. Paul Sidorian. Coming to you not broadcasting live in super low definition from G-Unit Studios for now compliments of Darth Vader himself. This is Paul Security Weekly episode number 820 being recorded on March 13th. 2024. Mr. Larry Pesce is to my left. Larry, welcome. Woohoo! Yay! Or something. What's going on, man? It's oh, good to have you here. Same old, same old. Let's move along. All Who right. Yeah, let's move it. Uh, so we have Josh Marpet here with us. Josh, welcome. Hey, ple- pleasure to be back. Uh, good to be seeing you in the studio for now. For now. And we, well, anyway, <laughs> Mandy Logan is here with us. <laughs> welcome, Mandy. Hi, thank you. Hello, all of my security weeklyans. How are you? We are good. Uh, Mr. Bill is here. Welcome, Mr. Bill. Oh, no, Mr. Bill. <laughs> oh, now we can't hear Bill because he's got himself muted somehow. Bill has like 18 different ways to mute himself, and he randomly selects one. And the, It is a nice hat, though. It's very festive. Yeah. Tall hat. trellis. Yes. So, I, heard, I heard it's a good place. Well, hey, hey, Paul, I guess I'm back. I don't know. Like, I just got back from stealing Tesla. I don't know how to turn on the mic. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, Security Weekly listeners can save $100 on their RSA Conference 2024 full conference pass. RSA Conference will take place May 6th through the 9th in San Francisco and on demand. Register using the discount code by visiting uh, securityweekly.com forward slash RSAC24. Use the code 54USSECWEEKLY. Hope to see you there. Uh, also, make sure you subscribe to Below the Surface, uh, the podcast by Eclipsium in partnership with CRA. Myself and Alan Alfred are excited to bring you an entirely new season. For now, you can catch up at Eclipsium.com slash podcast. Omkar is here with us, and he is the general manager of the Open Source Software Foundation. He is an experienced cybersecurity and technical risk management executive with over 20 years of experience leading global cybersecurity projects. Previously, he was the director of engineering at Regulated Cloud for Regulated Cloud at Google and has led security organizations at financial and technology institutions. He is an accomplished author with several granted patents and has led contributions to many international standards and a senior fellow with the NYU Center for Cybersecurity. Omkar, it's wonderful to have you on the show tonight. Wonderful to see you as well and to be here with everyone. Kind of jealous I'm not in the studio. Y'all have some whiskey that I really adore. 
Mm. Only one small correction. It is the Open Source Security Foundation. Yeah, I would. I, you know, no, I'm like Burgundy. I read what was on the teleprompter, and I think <laughs> I might have put it in the teleprompter wrong. Mm. So I apologize. All good. I mean, All it, it might have been the whiskey. <laughs> Could have been the whiskey. So, although uh, I'm drinking beer right now, I haven't yeah. worked my way up to whiskey. Just, so, I'm Carter, you're, you're a fan of the Basil Hayden's. I'm a fan of the, you know, I don't discriminate when it comes to whiskey. Um, I, I love all the whiskeys, be they rye, bourbon, scotch whiskey, Irish whiskey. We were in Japan uh, for Open SSF Day Tokyo back in December. And oh boy. Oh boy, that's right. Whiskey. Oh boy. All right, we need to hang out. Some of those, that's right. Yeah, some of their whiskeys are amazing. Onkar, how did you get your start in the information security? Um, way back in the day, about. 2002, 2003 or so, I was working at IBM. I was working on some pretty low-level stuff, uh, Linux kernel work, maintainer for Gen 2 Linux for those that have more CPU cycles than sense. Um, <laughs> and I saw a really interesting role in the IBM job database called Ethical Hacker. And I was like, huh, I know enough about operating systems to do that. And while I didn't have a flipper zero, I do now, mm -hmm. um, I applied and off I went. So I guess uh, in today's parlance for the new kids out there, uh, ethical hacking is what we used to call pen testing. And uh, that's how I got my entry into security. Omkar, the open SSF, for those that are not familiar with it, what is it? Yeah, you know, we've got this really easy peasy mission, which is to make open source software more secure. So super tractable, really easy, will be done by the end of the year. Um, <laughs> no small task. <laughs> oh, he said yeah, it was easy. Aside, Paul, he said it was easy. <laughs> right. It's fine. It's fine. We'll be fine. Um, you know, looking back at things historically, and maybe we'll start by going back about 10 years, uh, there was this security vulnerability, a memory safety vulnerability in OpenSSL called Heartbleed. Mm -hmm. And it was a innocent programming mistake that led to a fairly aggressive response by the industry to patch this. Fast forward a few years later, and there's this little thing called Log4J, and there's probably a half dozen of these, you know, name brand vulnerabilities that have occurred since that are all rooted in a particularly well-used open source library that either something slipped through the cracks or there was a rapid response required. So OpenSSF came together in and about 2000, in order or 2020 rather, in order to address this problem of how do we secure open source software? You went through my history. I've worked in technology organizations. I've worked in financial sector organizations. The one thing that's common there when developing software or in most private industry as a whole is you have a software development life cycle. You've got a way and a means of going through and ensuring certain qualities like the quality of security, are present before you release code. In open source, it's more like, you know, random whiz-bang files a PR request to your GitHub repository, and then you as a maintainer have to reason over whether you should accept it or not. There's no waterfall. There's no CI, CD pipeline. Um, and while those may exist in individual projects, there's no consistent way of writing open source software which is why it is this large, difficult, uh, and very rewarding challenge to work on on a daily basis. So that's our mission, to make open source software more secure. I do want to talk about memory safety. And I know I have this terrible analogy that just popped in my head, so <clears throat> bear with me. It oh might boy. work or it might not, right? I feel like when I first started learning to code in C, I was like, wow, this is really powerful. Like, I could screw things up. And it's kind of like the same thing like if you gave me like an actual lightsaber, I'd always, you know, I guess as we all like dream of, uh, you know, wielding an actual lightsaber. And I'm like, I would totally hurt myself with that thing, right, without using the force or proper training. And I feel like C is kind of the, is the same way and it gets a bad rap, but I think it, it can it be memory safe or do we just need to rewrite everything in Rust? Uh, the answer is obviously neither. Um, <laughs> but in all seriousness, I think there's there's always been a, a lot of cynicism about statements regarding memory safety. And I think we saw a lot of that come up. Um, just after, I think it was ONCD released a paper a couple of weeks ago, uh, you know, in, in, in some parlance, uh, declaring that the U.S. government has declared Rust is 
the language going forward and hail memory safe languages. Um, I think the truth of the matter is much more nuanced. So when we talk Ooh. about eliminating entire classes of vulnerabilities, there is a set of vulnerabilities associated with memory safety, and we can define those very specifically. It's things like spatial safety, which is, are you overflowing a buffer, putting too much data into a data structure, and thus overrunning the bound? There's temporal safety, which is, after you free memory, are you trying to access it again, which obviously is bad. There's type safety. So if you're an old C programmer, you know about typecasting. Are you accessing a region of memory and assuming it's going to be an integer when it's actually a character? Um, there's initialization safety, which means, hey, you're trying to access memory where it hasn't even been initialized yet or no memory has been allocated to a particular pointer. And then there's data race safety, which is if you're running multiple threads at once, you're expecting a data structure to be in a consistent state, but it's not because one thread raced ahead of the other and you don't have appropriate locking in place. All of these are really, really, really super hard to fix. Mm -hmm. And to your point about the lifesaver, C, C++, hey, if you want to go into assembler, those first four are almost, I mean, it's certainly possible to write safe code. Mm -hmm. However, it's this exponential decay that you face in being able to maintain that safety as you write more and more lines of code. And while it's hypothetically possible that somebody could write, write completely memory safe C, you know, history has shown us otherwise. So the other side of it is even when using Rust, you could theoretically get into data race thread safety issues. But a lot of the issues around spatial safety, temporal safety, type safety, initialization safety, all those disappear. And it's not a property that's unique to Rust. There's certainly lots of other languages that afford this, Java, JavaScript, uh, Python. But you're not going to write an operating system kernel in Python. And there's reasons mm. you can't do that. Mm. So to come back around to it, it's really hard to make C or C++ memory safe. It's also an intractable problem to simply wash everything with Rust and assume that that is going to be the answer. If you've developed software for any reasonable amount of time, you know, every time somebody goes in and monkeys with it and refactors even a simple function, you have this cascading effect of potentially uh, larger issues caused by whether it be somebody implementing the spec wrong, whether it be the new language handling things in a different manner, like there's all there's an almost an infinite set of things that could cause the new code to act differently than the old code. And we're talking in the so, same coding language, right? Because I've 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 done this, and then like fairly recently, I saw a meme that was like, "Ha, huh, I have my code working. This is great." And all of us have been there, right? You get it working, and then you go look at it, and you're like, "It's kind of kind of sloppy." Like. I need to clean that up. I need to refactor it, right, is the term that pops in our head. And then you refactor it, and you're like, wow, it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're, a better, you're a better developer than I am, man. Like, I, I start with, damn it, why isn't it compiling? <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, glossed over, I glossed over that. <laughs> that I'll be part. honest. My, but, head, my head was just, you know, thinking about writing a kernel in Python and thinking about making C and C++ <sighs> memory safe, and now my head hurts. Thank you. So, and you're not even drinking. <laughs> Uh, this might not be water. <laughs> he is now. <laughs> not water. Um, but yeah, and as, as with any developer, right, then you start switching languages and you get into all kinds of other funny nuances for those that haven't played with um, software as much. C and all these other languages, even really old languages like C that's almost 50 years old now, they have a spec, and the spec declares how the language should work. But there's a lot of things that are undefined in the spec of the language, which is why, to give you a very simple example, today you still can't compile the Linux kernel with LLVM clang out the gate. You still have to apply a bunch of patches because the kernel itself and its compilation depends on a bunch of things that aren't defined well in the C spec, but GCC just does because that's how GCC works. Mm -hmm. So you start to get into this really weird state, or maybe not weird, a really low-level state 
where there are specific things like down to machine instructions that may be compiled out differently. So while you've afforded yourself memory safety, you could have APIs that are responding slightly differently. You could have different performance characteristics. And while all of this may not make much difference for you or I when we're accessing a web page, like think about things like nuclear reactors or flight control surfaces. You probably want those at least being consistent, right? Mm. Yeah, <clears throat> for sure. Consistency is the hobgoblin of little mind. Come on. Why would you want them <clears throat> consistent? Just so they could be safe or something? If you want Ooh. safe, go live. <laughs> well, never mind. There's nuclear reactors we're talking about. No worries. I, I, but I think of it as we're, if we're going to uh, rewrite code in a different language, I want to come back to that for a moment. And, you know, I liken that to even if I change Linux distributions, I'm just exchanging one set of problems for yet another different set of problems, more than likely. At least that's been my experience with Linux distributions. Now we translate that to code that has been written, you know, the first version was 20 years ago like pseudo that we've maintained for not, not like we, us, but thankfully other people have maintained for 20 years. And then we go, well, we're just, we're just going to rewrite all that and it'll be, it'll be fine. I don't, that's not feasible. Right. Well, I think Microsoft just did. So I haven't tried it out. But. Oh I, yeah, I did. You know, it's funny. I use that example and I forgot that Microsoft had, uh, had done that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They just released it. Uh, I think it was last week or something. I, I still haven't yet tried it out. Um, Maybe when it gets over to Debian, I'll, uh, I'll I'll have a chance to do so. But you're you're 100 correct. Like when we think about stability in software, it isn't that the software is necessarily perfect. It means after years and years and years and years, we have software and we know how it will react in any given situation. And it's much like I think a great analogy for this, and hopefully my wife doesn't hear me. Um, it's like an old marriage, right? Doesn't mean everything's perfect, but if you know exactly how your spouse is going to react given a particular set of input, that's safe. Um, if they react in a way that's unexpected, that's unsafe. And the same applies to code. Like if you know that every time you execute this order of instructions, your system will start to grind to a halt, you know to predict that. If instead of grinding to a halt, you suddenly sig sev and the program faults and crashes, that's unexpected. So being able to get to that level of predictability, I think, is something that you're trading off when you start recoding. Um, the but I, I, thing Carl, that, I, I just, I love your analogy too, because I sometimes have these conversations with my wife and it's usually because I've messed up, which is more than often not the case. And I'm like, when I tell you this, this is what, how you're going to react and what you're going to say. And then I tell her that. And it seems to soften the blow like a little bit. Another, I think, healthy exercise is we do imitations of each other uh, in the family uh, to make each other aware. Because we know the, the behavior, right? It's, it's expected that, that people are going to behave this way in the house because we all live together. So, that's, And it feels, sa it. It feels it safe. Exactly. It feels safe to do that, I guess, is the point, right? It, exactly. Back to safety. Um, so I, I think that's definitely the case. Now... There, the other part of this and the very nuanced part of this, and we use this word with reckless abandon within security, but I think it actually bears mentioning now, is to take a risk-based approach. And what I mean by that is if you have particular code paths within your application that are especially sensitive, but maybe more internal facing, so they're not exposing much in the way of external functionality, great example of this could be cryptographic routines. Those are great candidates for recoding in a memory safe language. To use the Wayback Machine, 2014, Artbleed. Again, that was a memory safety issue in OpenSSL. If we were writing that in a memory safe language, it would have been, and if memory serves, that was a spatial safety issue with a buffer overflow or an overread, pardon me, it would have been a moot point. It, it, it would not have been an issue that would have resulted in that kind of memory safety issue. Does that mean that you should rewrite the entire thing being open SSL and Rust? Well, that's, that's going to be pretty hard. But to take the risk-based example, if you can highlight a subset of code paths, maybe code paths that take input, 
things that take input like off the network are infamous for buffer overflows. Maybe that's a way to make that code path safer without necessarily having to worry about some of the issues, be it human from recoding or undefined from switching languages that would normally yield even further bugs. So it's, it's a balance. In your opinion, Omkar, do we have a better understanding or, or knowledge of how to write better software in terms of processes? I'm thinking like unit testing with coverage that can be automated in any number of languages today. Does that help us in terms of being able to rewrite even just these uh, certain components? It does. I mean, but it's all, as I always say, like take, take everything with a grain of salt, right? There's definitely ways to do this better. There's also ways to game test coverage uh, in order to get very yeah. good test coverage, but not really functionally test anything more properly. There's also entire um, fields of study around things like... Um, functional security verification to make sure that at any point in the state machine, given a set of inputs and a system state, the set of outputs is tractable or is known. All of these are great things, but there's always a trade-off with time. Like the reason that formal uh, verification or formal methods are used for a limited set of code paths is because once they get out of a very simple state machine, they are extremely difficult to scale across a general code base, which is why you usually see formal methods applied to things like cryptographic libraries, but not <clears throat> generally to something like a web server. So with any of these things, we are making incremental progress and in making things better. Um, at the OpenSSF, we really pub recently published a C and C++ hard compiler hardening guide because we recognize like it's not like C is going to turn off tomorrow. There's still a lot of projects that are developed in C and require C in order to function properly. There's a lot of safety critical applications and there's just a lot of C and C++ out there. Um, there's also developments in the hardware field. Uh, so I believe ARM has a set of ex extensions called MTE which ensure, as it pertains to temporal safety and spatial safety and a, a couple of other um, memory safety classes, that they become very hard to exploit. It doesn't mean that the language itself has changed, but instead of the program allowing a memory safety issue or the operating system to allow a memory safety issue, the program will basically fault and crash which, you know, not a great outcome, but it's better than causing a security issue. Mm. There's also a risk extension called Cherry, um, which I believe Risk Five has implemented, which it, and ARM is looking at implementing as well, which again, allow us to rely upon capabilities in the hardware rather than having to switch languages. And if we go way back, way back, way back, there's a number of operating system functions like ASLR and things of that nature that even if you're using a memory unsafe language makes it incredibly hard to exploit something like a buffer overflow because of layout randomization and things of that nature. Not to mention like no execute pages. I think that goes back to like, I think that goes back to Pentium 3, hmm. but there's a number of mitigations that have been made in hardware as well as software operating system as well as app layer over the years that make all these less likely, but they're still around. There's And there's still research going on too. I feel like that I trace back some bug classes to the eighties or even before, right? Like someone a long time ago figured out that, hey, the null pointer dereference is like a thing. I think it's just a, a bug right now. And it took us a long time to figure out like, oh, that can actually be exploited and we should have countermeasures to that. And I'm not sure how language specific some of the, you know, bug classes are. Certainly there are some that are specific. I guess my question, Omkar, is, is as we adopt newer languages, is there a greener field for us to some, find some of these new bug classes? Um, hopefully, uh, but also maybe not. And what I mean by that, so I think we just passed, I think December was the 25th anniversary 
of SQL injection as reported in Frack Magazine. If you want to go back into the Wayback Machine, 1972 mm. was the first time that somebody identified memory safety as a concern. There was a an Air Force publication uh, about it. So a lot of these have been around for a pretty darn long time. Um, my hope is that eventually we'll get to the stage that some of these vulnerabilities are things of the past. We're not there yet. Um, there are certainly, like I said, there have been mitigations that have made it a lot harder. Um, one of the ways that, great example, uh, when I was at Google, one of the ways that Google eliminated cross-site scripting vulnerabilities across a broad set of their applications was to use an input sanitization library consistently across everything that guarded against that. That's, you know, one way a fairly large organization did this. Um, Apple, when they came out with, um, I believe there was a, I think the function is called k type. When they came out with that in iOS, that again led to an entire way of not having a memory safety vulnerability within iOS. So there's all these different kind of incremental steps forward. But going back to the um, reminiscing slash complaint that I had about SQL injection, like we're now memory safe, but there's still a class of vulnerability that hasn't yeah. been solved. And I think the, uh, the challenge of our field might be that we need to start thinking of different ways of writing software rather than trying to quality check software in. There's something to be said for this idea of secure by default. And how do we, especially when we think of the scope of all open source software today, which I'm sure you probably think about quite often, <laughs> Omkar, how do, we, how do we get them all to a standard security level of not just memory safety, but like security issues in general. I mean, we've followed the news for a long time. There's a lot of different ways we can break software uh, is to, in security context. There, there's a ton. Um, and as we were chatting about earlier, I don't, unlike most organizations that have this top-down software development process, the open source community is the open source community. There's no consistent entity. There's no architecture board that you can go to and go plead your case. Everyone will develop software as they may. So there's a couple of ways that we're doing this. Uh, one, we've got things like OpenSSF Scorecard, uh, which is a project that I believe runs on over a million packages on GitHub and GitLab Weekly. And it literally provides you a report card about all these popular packages that are out there. Why is that important? Well, if you as a developer are considering taking a dependency on an SSL library and you've got to choose between open SSL, polar SSL, and boring SSL, which one do you pick? The one with the most the, likes and the most forks. Wolf is SSL always stars. the end, right? Is, and stars, stars. And stars, yep. right? Yep. Those are the, the three metrics, <laughs> and, right? And, and as we learned recently the, with the... Or the one with the cool name, Wolf SSL. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Oh, Wolf right? SSL. Can't forget that. Yeah. Um, but security score or uh, open SSF scorecard gives you the ability to reason over a series of security metrics and determine which one may be appropriate to you. And we check for things like branch protection, two factor authentication for the developers, which I guess GitHub's changing to a default shortly. But there's all these kind of security metrics that you can reason over at a glance and make an informed decision. Um, in addition to that, for your own projects, we have this thing called All-Star, which acts as almost like a policy engine to make sure that your GitHub repo is has immutable settings for all the security things that matter. And those are some incremental ways. The other way that we're looking to focus our efforts in 2024 and beyond is to think about the watering holes of the open source community. So the watering holes of the open source community are software and package repos. This could be PyPI in Python. This could be crates in Rust. This could be NPM when it comes to our friends in JavaScript land. There's all these different places, these watering holes, where if we can positively affect the security properties of those repositories, then all the packages stored there within become more secure as a result. So we've had really good success 
with doing things like through Alpha Omega, getting all of Pi PI on SigStore in order to better mm-hmm. assure provenance of the packages that are present. Uh, with, we also just announced some work that's being done with Homebrew for those that are using Macs and mm-hmm. have installed Homebrew at home. Um, all of these, we believe that if we're able to work with the package maintainers in order to put this robust kind of infrastructure in place, then if I'm just tooling around at home and I've got a project that appears in one of these repos, it will inherently, it will inherit the security properties of the repo. Mm. Um, so those are two way, or I guess three ways, if you count scorecard and uh, all star as two different projects. Uh, some three of the ways that we're helping. We also recently. Oh, oh, I wanted to ask you a question. Yeah. Uh, I was listening to the Open Source Security Podcast, which I, I love. Uh, Josh and Kurt are amazing. Mm-hmm. They asked a very, I thought was a very good question that I want to ask you, and that is, is any security flaw or vulnerability in GitHub a supply chain vulnerability? I think any security vulnerability, any place along your consumption pipeline is a vulnerability, full stop. So it could be GitHub, it could be SourceForge, it mm-hmm. could be your own hosted CVS server, whatever it is. If there is something that allows people to manipulate the integrity of the source code that you're consuming, and you consume that without awareness, that is a vulnerability. Mm. Yes. I think in the context they were talking about, it was actually the flaws in GitHub that allowed people to create projects that were similar, but also had the forks and the stars uh, along, along with it uh, to try and trick people, which is interesting. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that one, but um, but yeah, wherever, look, if you, it doesn't matter where you store the source code, if the integrity of the source code is questionable and people have affected that intentionally or unintentionally, then absolutely agree, it's a security issue. I, I, I was just, I was going to ask you, you want to comment on Microsoft owning GitHub and how, how that impacts it, but <laughs> I'll leave that open uh, to any, anyone who Microsoft owns GitHub. <laughs> right, I mean that's a fact. That's a, that's a yeah. fact, right? But and I think it's in Microsoft's best interest to protect the integrity of GitHub. They're likely consuming software from from GitHub as well. Yeah, I, I would assume so. Um, both Microsoft and GitHub are members, and uh, I believe I can't remember how long ago Microsoft bought GitHub. Now was it 2017, 18, something like that? It's been a while. Uh, questions from from other folks. I'm good. Um, you, you, I'll let you think about that. <clears throat> um, the U.S. Office of National Cyber Director, the ON, ONCD, what, what is that and how does it play into memory safety? Is it just a mission in the report or what, what larger role do they play, Omkar? So the U.S. Office of the National Cyber Director, um, ONCD, is a branch within the executive office I b- believe Chris Krebs uh, was the original national yes. director of cybersecurity. Yes. Um, then there were, I think, a couple of interns, and now Harry Coker is the uh, new permanent uh, confirmed director. Um, much like many executive office branches, they're, they're not legislating, but they do have the power to influence. Um, they... I think one of the interesting areas that they convened was this group across a number of agencies within the U.S. federal government um, called OS3I to represent uh, open source security. So while they put out the RFI last year um, for input on memory safety as well as uh, open source security, it was really a conglomerate behind the scenes uh, within the within the U.S. government that received it and will be will be taking action on it. So um, they were the ones that had put out this uh, paper called, I believe it's called Back to the Building Blocks, where they advocate for uh, memory safety, but not only memory safety, one of the interesting areas that they advocate for that we are spending more time on is this idea of metrics and measurement. So if you take the analogy that open source is a public good like water. 
if you are consuming water yourself, like you've gone on a hike and you come across a creek and you take some water, fill up your uh, canteen and chug it down, you you bear responsibility for your own actions. Like nobody is coming in and saying the water is not safe, sue the forest. Um, you've, you've got to figure that out for yourself. And there's certainly methods and means by which you can do so. If, however, you're a large beverage company or a soft drink producer and you are producing vast quantities of water or you're consuming vast quantities of water and producing soda or something out of it, there are certain metrics that you're obliged to comply with. Now, you may choose to check those metrics as a personal consumer as well. But where this analog is going is the same is true of open source. If we can come up with better metrics and measurements to tell us whether the open source software that we're consuming is secure, then we are going to be better consumers of that. But not only that, commercial producers, commercial software producers that are consuming open source for the purpose of building other software can not only understand that, but also prove their conformance with said metrics. So I think that's incredibly interesting because the point that we're at is we all know that we don't want to be insecure, but we lack the metrics to prove that reliably. And I think one of the most interesting parts of that report is the focus on that as a future field of study. Bill, you had a question. Yeah, uh, thanks. So, um, Kara, just want to say, like, you know, I am a, a big user of open source software pretty much every day. Um, and I assume that you've written all of it. And I just want to thank you for that. Right. So, uh, but, uh, you know, my, my real to the question, community. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I'm just, I'm just playing. Um, you know, so I'm just curious, you know, so, so open SSF is something new to me. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, been as you've been talking, just been reading through your page, and um, you know, I'm just kind of interested. Really, I have two questions. Uh, are first, what you know, like what big wins uh, have you guys had? You know, sure, cer certainly there are things that you guys are are proud of, and uh, you know, somebody like myself who um, you know, I, I I write code, I um, you know, I, I use open source. What what can I do to help? Right. So, just those are the two things I'd like to hear. Great questions. Um, I'll, I'll back into those. So openssf.org slash get involved uh, lists all the ways that you can get involved. If you're an individual user, this is all open source. Uh, you can join any work group. You can participate in the Zooms. You can participate in the mailing list. Getting involved literally means going to openssf.org slash get involved, choosing the meetings that you participate in. If you are a Corporate organization, there's opportunities to join the OpenSSF as a member. Uh, there's a number of different classes of membership from premier members that take an active seat in steering the direction of OpenSSF through our board and the committees of the board uh, to general members that uh, operate in both the work groups as well as a couple committees, uh, but seek to engage more closely with the execution of the work. Ac uh, associate members are made up of academia as well as other um, academia and other nonprofits. Uh, so there's tons of ways to get involved. And you don't need to be a developer. Uh, like many open source projects, some of our work is documentation. Some of our work is hosting meetups in uh, local uh, local cities around the world for people that are also interested in open source security. For those that will be or have the ability to travel to the Seattle area, April 15th, we're going to be there hosting our Open SSF Sauce Securing Open Source Software Community Day, uh, which will precede the Open Source Summit North America. We have another one of those in Europe in September. We just announced that we're going to be having our first securing open source software fusion event in Atlanta, which will be a standalone event, totally focused on open source security. Uh, more to come on that, but around April 15th, we'll do a press release. We've got a really interesting keynote speaker there. These are all ways you can get involved. Um, when it comes down to key wins, uh, we've got a fair amount of our wins up on our website. We, we post quite frequently. Uh, one of the favorites that I have is the 2003 annual report where it lists 
all the thousands of places that we have positively affected um, the security community. You know, we've delivered, I believe, tens of thousands of different training courses. There's, as I mentioned earlier, I think over a million packages that are being scanned by scorecard on a daily basis. I'm resisting the urge to open the PDF because then I'll just start reading rather than engaging in the conversation. <laughs> uh, but it's all up there on OpenSSF.org. One of the things that I'm proudest of uh, that just happened last week is um, we partnered with the White House National Security Council to provide 250 free training and certification uh, courses in cybersecurity to the women of Jordan uh, in conjunction with Ann Neuberger's visit over to Jordan, which I thought was a wonderful way of kicking off Women's History Month. Uh, in terms of capacity building, we need more people that are familiar with cybersecurity. And in terms of diversity and inclusion, we can't solve the problems that we created using the same thinking that created them. So we mm -hmm. need to get more people involved. No, so that's, that's one of the point. things I'm most proud of. I want to I want to go back to uh, GitHub slightly and uh, ask somewhat a more technical question uh, that I thought of was if you've got an open source project right I as a security reacher I find a vulnerability in that I disclose it responsibly to that project and they go oh, that's a that's a problem let me go fix that and we decide like this shouldn't necessarily be public but also at some juncture a code commit has to be published to GitHub, which is typically in a public repository, and those that are kind of spry, uh, I'd like to include myself in that, tend to look at commits and go, that could be for a security vulnerability that hasn't hit the news cycle, it hasn't had a CVE fully assigned or, or publicized yet. And I want to say we covered it a couple years ago on the show. There's facilities for open source projects to handle this particular situation. Is that true? That's my understanding. Um, I... We'll have to get back to you with specifics, but mm. I know there's a way of providing security fixes under embargo in a way that doesn't show up in the public repository until the embargo lifts. Sweet. And that's intentional and by design. I will also caution that all of this is risk-based and depends on your level of paranoia. Mm -hmm. If in this, you should also consider GitHub to be part of your control plane, right? So if you are uncomfortable with the prospect of GitHub being part of your control plane, then what I would suggest is having a private Git repo that you maintain on your own for just these type of sensitive patches, maybe an option. Mm -hmm. But this is one of those risk-based kind of discussions that you need to have uh, amongst your project. Normally, I normally that level of paranoia um, is solved by not actually committing to the public repo or merging the PR in the public repo or even filing the PR in the in the public repo until time is ready. Right, right. Because it does tip the hand, but also like you're right in the risk-based equation, like, okay, who's there's millions of commits every day. I don't know, I'm just making that yeah. number up. But there's a lot of commits every day. And there's a lot of commits. To sift through all of them would be would be hard. Yeah. I think it was Aqua Security. I don't know if you you saw their uh, their research, but they they talked about zero days and half days, um, and kind of defined what each of those are like. And so there's some time of from like discovery to disclosure to signing a CVE in in various forms, and you know making the code commit. And those happen at different times. And they release this little project that can basically, I believe, it's based on a a CVE, and then based on that, go to the reap and see if they can find a commit that maybe talks about memory safety, but like it's a, a regular expression or whatever, right? I think that's pretty fascinating uh, to me who covers the news cycle, also does this stuff for my day job and I wanna know about it before everyone else <laughs> kind of thing. So I think that's kind of that's kind of neat, but I, I also, yeah. I, it's a double-edged sword too. I don't want bad things to happen as a result of that either. I, I totally agree. There's, there's two additional shout outs that I'm gonna give, uh, one, <laughs> When I was in financial sector, uh, the regulators forced us to do these things called tabletop exercises, which basically prove that your operational security processes are sound, right? So you go through a scenario where you pretend there's an incident, you have your security operations team, you have your engineering team, your legal team, comms team, and everybody goes through their paces. We're going to be holding a tabletop exercise at our event in Seattle, 
including the open source community. Now, the reason that I mentioned this is you talked about almost this pipeline of events that has to occur when you're taking in a security vulnerability under embargo. Well, we want to exercise things like that. We want to help the community understand, hey, what is the list of one through 10 steps that you need to take from first getting a email to your security at email address all the way out to pushing it out to GitHub and having a CVE assigned. So we hope to exercise some of that there. The other bit that I forgot to mention when we were talking about things that we're proud of, I believe, we believe that a educated developer is a secure developer. We also recognize there's a ton of security training out there, but security vulnerabilities continue to occur. Mm. So we're currently conducting a survey. It's up on our website um, under the most recent blog page on secure software development. If you're a developer, if you're a security person, if you're somebody interested in the, in the space, please take the survey because the results of this survey will be used to improve security education and create an entire new wave of educated developers that hopefully uh, have better materials so they don't make some of the mistakes of the past. Omkar, I, I'm going to ask this next question, and I don't want to make it seem like I'm critical of CVE or NVD because I want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. But the because, first step because, is... Because that comes later in the news. Right. <laughs> but the first, literally where I was going yeah. with this, so the keep first going, step, Paul. The first step is, though, addressing some of the challenges. And so yeah. I believe there are many. NVD, uh, NIST, uh, NVD currently has a, a notice on their website, right, that says, hey, we're working to establish a consortium. They, they're recognizing that there's problems. Uh, what is your assessment of... Uh, any of the challenges or potential suggestions for improvement that we could have on the CVE programs, on CVSS, and in these uh, facilities we rely upon? I think there are numerous challenges. I think that the CVE, the entire CVE process um, has received a lot of critical feedback over the last little while. Mm. <clears throat> I think there's, um, I think, Tracking things that focus on exploitability um, certainly bears, certainly makes a lot more sense these days. Like the amount of everyone can pick a CVE in the, from the past that has been a proverbial CVSS 10 out of 10. Uh, but then due to nuance in your environment or due to how difficult it is to actually ex exploit the vulnerability, you know, none actually appear in the field. And all of a sudden we've run around like chickens with their heads cut off, trying to resolve something that maybe wasn't the right focus. Spectrum so meltdown. I think, <clears throat> sorry. Spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> there's, I mean, there's so many of those vulnerabilities out there. And I think by focusing more on exploitability, we will get ourselves to a better place. Um, however, the fact that an exploit has been created adds an even more urgent uh, kind of tipping of the scale. And to use an example from just the last week, there was a recent Microsoft vulnerability, I forget what the CVE number is, but it was this notion of an admin to kernel vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And even once you get down the exploitability path, there's a genuine question in terms of architecture and design, right? Microsoft has made very strong statements about admin to kernel not being a security boundary due to the privilege that admin acts with. However, there's this special edge case that was discovered in which a vulnerability could be exercised that gives people concern. So I think in addition to some of the obvious improvements that we need to make around measuring exploitability versus vulnerability, we also need to come up with common language about what expectations are in terms of the security control services between different subsystems. You know, it, and it's interesting, Omkar, it kind of begs the question that I've asked and have not done the research on, is Microsoft talks about admin to, to kernel, and they're like, oh, that's, we, but they fixed it, which is kind of funny, um, but good. And, but when we get to Linux, is there, there's not a whole lot of separation between root and, and kernel today in Linux, although that answer is always like, it depends, right? Yeah, I mean, if you look at some of the stuff around SE Linux, I think that provides yes. uh, a bit more nuanced and granular control versus complete super user, super root. 
Uh, but but you're right. I mean, traditionally, historically, and I presume a lot of this comes from the POSIX roots mm-hmm. of Linux. Um, a lot of these things, hey, if you're UID zero, you're UID, you're UID zero. Here's the lightsaber, right? <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> That's awesome. I know I have to run. We're, we're running short on time. but uh, And I'm glad you covered all the things that are happening in uh, OpenSSF. And I thought it was a great uh, evangelist uh, moment for uh, OpenSSF. And do we have, do we have time for, for five quick questions? Five quick questions? Sure. All right. Three words to describe yourself. Tired, old, cranky. <laughs> What's the second question, Larry? Because I don't have Touch it an on optimist. This, I don't have it on this laptop. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you write a book yourself right. about yourself, what would the title be? Oh, what would the title be? Um, going somewhere from nowhere, and it's huh. a bit of a nod to the fact that I had a pretty a typical way in to the industry. Um, never completed my undergrad. Oh. Um, never, I mean, I, I, I kind of fumbled my way through high school from a grade point perspective, uh, but I think I've done okay. And uh, for another fun fact, I guess lecture applied cryptography at NYU. So maybe I'll go back and get my undergrad someday. <laughs> <laughs> if you were a serial killer, what would be a weapon of choice? Ooh. Code. Trevor Shea. <laughs> oh, all right. Oh, nice. nice. The, the, the launched at or <laughs> launching of? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> what is your favorite hacker movie? Ooh. And why is it sneakers? I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say Swordfish, but that was honestly because I had such a crush on Holly Berry. That's mm. re- the valid. You're not alone. You're not, valid. It's valid. Yep. Yep. You're not, not alone. alone. Yep. yep. Tracks. Yeah. Uh, choose two celebrities to be your parents, alive, dead, fictional, or otherwise. Uh, the Stumper. Grace Hopper and Dennis Ritchie of C fame. God, and I don't oh. think Grace Hopper needs introduction. No. Omkar, awesome. thank you so much for appearing on Paul Security Weekly. It was a pleasure being here. Look forward to doing this again, folks. Absolutely. With that, we'll take a short break. Come back with the security news. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. 